O Lord, accept the sweet fragrance of our innocence and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with the angels, to proclaim it with your women disciples, and to rejoice in it with your pure apostles. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever.
for the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior and announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Christianity has Sunday, 
because we are conscious of our Lord's resurrection on the first day of the week. And therefore we have an assembly every Sunday. And the faithful, those who are faithful, come. And they commemorate the first creation, which has been renewed in the new creation of the resurrection of the Messiah. But when the pagans, the pagans had a totally different way of looking at the divine. For them, the divine was something you either had to placate, so they'd stop sending you hail and storms, or that they would send you rain and give you stuff. And so you would appear at the temple when you needed something. And you'd come with whatever you were going to offer to the temple, offer to the gods. And that's what you were looking at. It was a very self-serving and very self-centered religion. What Christianity does is remind us that what you are doing as an individual by the baptism into our Lord's death and resurrection is to enter into a future glory as part of the body of Christ. And the virtue of hope, as we mentioned here, these divine effects and this divine transformation of the individual and in the depth of their prayer is an orientation to the awaiting of the full union with our Lord in glory. So we mentioned in the beginning that hope is not just wistful thinking. I like this, and wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if I had a new car? Wouldn't it be nice if I had a bigger house? Wouldn't it be nice if my husband threw out that junky old suit that he insists on wearing all the time? Wistful thinking is just kind of fantasy. Hope has a vision of a goal, and it also sees the basis that are the means to that goal. So we open the new school year. We have our new Colby door. We have all of the kids who start coming back. We enter into college, and many of us did the same thing. We enter into college and youth with the idea of something that we're going to do with this formation, hopefully. But it also means that I know that by going to classes, that's how I'm going to attain to that profession, and that there is a means for me to arrive at that place. There is hope that I shall finish as being whatever, a physician or a lawyer. It's not the person who's sitting home, eating a third bag of chips, watching television, thinking, you know, I really like to make $130,000 a year. And then just keep crunching down on chips and watching television. That's just sheer fantasy. Hope is not only a goal of what we can see as being possible, but we also see the means by which we arrive at it. That is the virtual hope. It's hope in the general sense, as you mentioned, education. It can be hope in many other aspects of our life. And St. Paul is speaking about it here as hope, as the virtue, the theological virtue. It's part of that divine transformation of the individual that we see heaven as not only being something which is desirable, but something that I can be engaged in in these steps in order to arrive at it. Now, unfortunately, we live in an era in which many people have kind of returned to paganism, baptized or not, in which they see the divinity as something that I get stuff from. And so they've forgotten also that it's the notion of a transformation of my life here and now. But it also means that for the same point, it's a wistful thinking for them that I desire to go to heaven. And that somehow when I die, it just happens. That is not at all what St. Paul is saying here. Heaven doesn't just happen. It is the conclusion of an engagement of hope of that goal. That's what this chapter is about. This is what St. Paul is saying. And what he's saying is that we have testimony of this reality by the transformation of your lives, by the presence of the Spirit within your life gives a witness to what God is trying to accomplish in our life. If I act like a pagan, think like a pagan, have the principles of a pagan, I'm a pagan, whether I'm baptized or not, because I'm clearly not engaged with the faith and the principles by which my spirit is transformed is not the gospel, but is rather whatever, my iPad C 
CNN, whatever it might be. Those are the principles by which I live. And so in this engagement, St. Paul is saying that the Spirit of God which is present, showing, and we talked about that last week with the Thessalonians. He says, everyone knows of how much you changed, the 180 degree change when you moved away from idols to the living God. And so that is one testimony. The hidden Father whose work in us is to conform us to the death and crucifixion of His divine Son. The Father Himself witnesses to what this work is being accomplished in us. And of course, St. Paul says that the Son Himself, by what He is doing to bring us towards a greater conformity of His reality in the Gospel, is also witness to what God is trying to accomplish in our lives. And that's what St. Paul is focusing on right there. Is he saying there is a purpose to your suffering and the things that you go through in life? They are not futile. They are not worthless. They are not unreasonable and irrational stupidities at this point. Because in Christianity, what we wind up seeing is that God is using these things, this difficulty, this betrayal, that disappointment, this discouragement, he says they become transformed within the Spirit of God because they are conforming us to Calvary and to the crucifixion of Christ our Lord. And because they do that, the more that they conform us to that crucifixion, the more testimony we are receiving that we are have that greater hope in the resurrection and the glory. Because the closer that we are conformed with Christ in His death on Calvary, the more certitude we have in hope of the glory of the resurrection. Which is why the church from the very beginning has always honored the martyrs. They give the most perfect witness of laying down their lives for the truth of the gospel. To testify that this is true. And that perfect conformity of death with our Lord on Calvary, we have always had the certitude of their glory in heaven. Which is why all we have to do for a canonization of a martyr is show that they're actually a martyr. We don't have to go through the whole process of miracles and all these other things. Just merely the fact that they died for virtue and the faith. And so St. Paul says, so you must be concerned, overly concerned, that this disappointment, that discouragement, this betrayal, this pain, this illness, that they have a value now within God. And therefore they become also a testimony of our greater hope in the resurrection as we are made conformed to Calvary. And so what hope does for us is give us an earnestness, a greater sense of purpose and a direction towards a goal. And it gives purpose to our lives. We've mentioned this before. Christianity doesn't mean we don't suffer. Sometimes actually on the contrary. You look at St. Rafa, the very fact that the deeper she embraced the gospel, the more that she physically suffered and was ailing throughout her life. But what it does do is give reason and purpose and meaning to that suffering. And St. Paul here in chapter 8 of the Romans is pointing out that it is a basis of our hope. It is no longer a discouragement and a despair to run off to the gods to ask for this or that to be changed and then pull the, the arm of the vending machine hoping to get something better because I made the sacrifice. And St. Paul says that in using this, this gives us then the understanding of the means towards the end. And then he finishes by talking about this very strange image of nature. That nature itself is groaning and is in labor pains. Okay, ladies, think of all those moments in ER, screaming away in the delivery room, and then you bring forth life into this world. St. Paul says that is what nature and creation is doing now. And again, the reaction is kind of, huh? What? This image is very graphic. Because he says creation itself has been wounded by the sin of Adam. And that we go around and we see our beautiful mountains and we stand in awe of Katahdin. And we have a right to it. These are beautiful things. But the Christian 
Christians have always understood that they are not as beautiful as they were in the beginning. That escapes our imagination. But we know that creation itself has been wounded by the sin of Adam. The sin of man, mankind was created in paradise at the pinnacle. And therefore the wound of Adam, the sin of Adam that brings this wound upon each of us, also affected the trees and the mountains and the bunny rabbits and the flowers. And he says, he talks about it as being subjected into ineffectiveness and futility. There is a frustrating aspect of nature that itself knows and longs for the revelation, he says, of the sons of God, the children of God. Only in the 19th century did we start adoring the mountains. I mean, before, since paganism. Christianity always saw nature as being beautiful as the work of the hand of the Creator, but as being wounded. It's why the fathers of the desert go out into the desert, not just to get away, but to go to the place that has not been redeemed, because there the demon dwells. And in the combat of their asceticism and in their prayer life, these men and these women went out into the desert to confront that fallen, that fallen world and the demon. It's why throughout Europe, mountains have crosses on top of them. It's not just to put something pretty on top. The idea through those centuries of Catholicism in Europe was that by the tilled field, by the mountain itself, by the cross on top, all of creation was also being initiated into the work of redemption. It is a totally different vision from the 19th century British lords who had nothing else to do with their money except to go vacationing in the Swiss Alps. And there they started romanticizing all of these things, all of the sublimity. And that became the religious spirit from the 19th century on. But in Christianity, that mountain is beautiful and is the handiwork of God, but is not part of the work of redemption until it is consciously introduced to it. Hence, the women and the men who went into the desert. Hence, in Europe, these crosses and these shrines on top of the mountains, that nature itself be brought into the work of redemption. It is a totally different vision. But it's also the reason as we live now through apostasy. And apostasy is just the Greek word for divorce. We just simply chuck God out the window and we go off on our merry way to find someone else. That's what apostasy means. It's why for the years when I lived in Europe, it was happening in Switzerland. Is that now the people that were hiking the mountains, some of them, were vandalizing these crosses, breaking them and pulling them down. Not because there was anything wrong with them, but because we turned to an apostasy of paganism. And therefore they found the crosses as being an aberration. There was a whole litigation that went on because we had a cross in a field outside the city of Freeburg. And we had a whole group of people that were throwing fits. Most of the population were probably indifferent. And many of the population still know, knew why these crosses were at the crossroads and on the mountains and why they were around. But they are now being vandalized and pulled down because the Christianity is dissipated. And also because even for the Christians who claim to hold on to the gospel, their vision of the work of redemption has been watered down. Many of us seeing those crosses in the Alps would think, well, that's pretty, that's nice. But we wouldn't know why they were there over these generations, if not centuries in many cases, with the Catholic vision of the work of redemption. So, it's an aside. But it's exactly that vision of what St. Paul says, that nature itself is also witness. It is longing for the day of the glory that is promised to each one of you, Romans. That revelation of glory on that definitive day. And so St. Paul leaves us with this thought today. That what is visible only by faith, that what is established 
and attained only through charity, is sustained in endurance and in perseverance to the day of our death by hope. And many people who are not in the pews of the churches around this country, even before all the shock and the scandal of everything else that's going on in human degradation, is because they had lost hope. They no longer saw it as being something that they needed to be engaged with to attain to, and therefore their next option, their next choice then was simply if to hang on to some vestige of Christianity was just kind of the fairy tale. That when I die, I just go there. That is not at all the teaching of St. Paul. It is the engagement, it is the witness, it is the purpose of our lives so that we not collapse, that we not give up along the path. But that when all of nature itself, we are oriented towards this day of glory, and he says that we ourselves wait for that redemption of our bodies. The word in the Greek actually means liberation. The day of the resurrection. Redemption is not yet complete. We still have steps to go. None of us are dead yet. Therefore, with that time in front of us, we are meant to redeem the time, to transform it in purpose, to establish it in hope, and be fixed upon that point of that moment of glory which God has promised to us, or at least as he says in the Gospel, to those who persevere to the end shall be saved. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
that the sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us warmly to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love. We may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Holy Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O servant of the Holy Spirit. And each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. Thank you. 
and center vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life in a world of distractions which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor may those who you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will we pray to you o lord
O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness. That through them we may be forgiven and made holy. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, of perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit, bless be in the name of the Lord. For He is one and heaven and on earth, to the end be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord our God, so that our bodies may be sanctified.
thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name, that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, for the nourishment of the blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.